Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Let me add one more welcome to those of us uh, here and those that are joining us online. We're glad that we're streaming this service uh, uh, this morning. And for all of you that are watching, we're glad you're with us. We're going to conclude the sermon by taking communion. So those in the room, if you didn't get the communion elements, just put your hand up and ushers will come and make sure you have those. And those at home, if you'd like to join with us, you can make sure you prepare your elements before we close the service today. Uh, it's great to be together, uh, virtually or in person, we're here. It's, it's good for us to worship together and to pray together. And I want to begin uh, this sermon with the Lord's Prayer. Some of you may have grown up praying this, know this by heart. We're going to pray it using debtors, not trespasses. It'll be on the screens. Let's pray this together. O oh, our Father in heaven, how would be your name? Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Some of you might have grown up knowing, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. That's actually not in the original translations, but let's say it together as a prayer. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. It's a wonderful prayer, a beautiful prayer. It's the prayer that Jesus prayed and taught his disciples to pray. We call it the Lord's Prayer. It's probably better named the Disciples' Prayer because he gave it to them as a pattern for prayer. Not the only words to pray, but a way in which we should pray. But I wonder sometimes, like, like worship songs and like uh, rituals that we get used to, you can kind of go through the motions in praying a prayer that's familiar and not think about the words that you're praying. Does that ever happen to you? You ever stop and think about what we're praying? We pray, your kingdom come and your will be done. What does it mean to pray God's kingdom would come? For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. What does it mean? We've been looking at this series in the Mark called Following the King. Jesus is our king. It's not language we use. Uh, we don't have a king. Uh, we, we fought a war over that. We just have presidents who act like kings. We, it's a very different thing. So what does it mean for us to follow Jesus as king in our culture today? What does that mean? Well, maybe the question we should ask is, what will it be like when his kingdom comes? What will it be like when his kingdom comes? We're praying your kingdom come. How do we know? What does it look like? What's it like? We've referred to the kingdom in this series and in various times as the blessings of the rule and reign of Jesus in our lives. The, the, the blessings, the, the, the markers of the rule and reign of Jesus in my life and in the world. But what does that look like? Last week we looked at a parable. Remember the story? The parable of the sower. A sower went out to sow seed. The kingdom is like a sower sowing seed. The kingdom doesn't come, Jesus says, by coercion, military force, by election, by policies. None of those things bring the kingdom of God. The kingdom comes like a little seed planted in a human heart, good soil, where it goes down deep. And, not, and for a while, you don't see much. It's beneath the surface. But over time, the word of God, the seed, will produce a harvest that you can't even imagine. We call it the kingdom, a harvest of righteousness, a kingdom harvest. Jesus then, after that parable of the sower, what the kingdom is like, gives us a taste, four stories in succession, four miraculous stories that give us glimpses of the kingdom, what it will be like someday, and what we get tastes of between this day and that day. We're going to look at Mark chapter 4, verses 35 through Mark chapter 5, verse 43, so we're covering almost an entire chapter, but I promise we'll, we won't take more than two hours. <laughs> What will the kingdom be like when it comes? Well, in, in brief, no disasters. That's chapter 4, verses 35 through the end. No demons, chapter 5, verses 1 through 20. No disease, chapter 5, verses 21 through 34. And no death, chapter 5, verses 35 to 43. These four stories, and we're gonna just, just going to uh, touch on them briefly, give us some glimpses of what life will be like under the rule and reign of Jesus when the king finally and fully comes. No disasters. Can you imagine that? No COVID-19. No coronaviruses of any kind. No cancer. No hurricanes. No floods. No demons. No evil. No dark powers. No oppression. No, no, no anxiety. No um, evil. No wickedness. No abuse. No death. 
No tearful goodbyes of a loved, to a loved one on a deathbed. No children taken too soon. No grief. It's hard to imagine a world like that, isn't it? It feels imaginary. Because we do live in a world that is undeniably marked by disasters, storms, difficulty, disease, death. We're living in a world scarred by those things. But if you stop and think about it, what, what would we expect? Living in a world that denies and rejects the king, we should expect that we would not fully realize and see what we mean by his kingdom. The promise of Jesus is that he's with us in this life and will be with us in the next when the kingdom finally comes. So we're going to look at these stories, and they all happen in the same geographical region. I'll show you a map of the Sea of Galilee, this region here, for reasons that I'll hopefully will become apparent. But when you read through the gospel accounts, maybe it's, you're new to this, you don't know where Jesus was or where these things took place. Jesus was born in Nazareth, and most of the, his ministry that you read about, feeding of the 5,000, for example, Sermon on the Mount, that all happened in this region right here. This is where that, all that stuff took place. Capernaum was sort of his home base for the beginning of his ministry, Peter's hometown. And that's where we read the story of him sailing out and the, and the storm that the disciples were afraid of. All that happened off that shore there in the Sea of Galilee. By the way, the Sea of Galilee, how many of you have been to Israel? Anybody? A couple of you, a handful? If you ever get the chance to go, you should go. The Sea of Galilee is not really a sea. It's more like a really big lake but not as big as the Great Lakes. It's about three or four times the size of Lake Geneva. So it's big, storms happen, but it's not a sea. Anyway, be that as it may. We're going to read a story about Jesus crossing the sea to a place called Gergesa, the region of the Gerasenes, and then crossing back and what happens. So my point is all the stuff that we read about happens up in the north part of Israel in Jesus' early life before he makes his way to Jerusalem in the south where in his final days. This region here, there were ten cities in this region, uh, in Jesus' day, referred to as the Decapolis. This was a Gentile area, a pagan area. These are Hellenistic, Greco-Roman cities. They weren't Jewish cities. Jews didn't go there. They were unclean cities. That'll become important as we go. This is the reason Jesus spent a lot of his time. These stories took place on opposite shores of the Sea of Galilee. Let's look at Mark chapter 4, verses 40 through 41. So before we read this, some of you know the story. Jesus sets out across the Sea of Galilee, tells his disciples in the boat, and a storm comes up that terrifies these men who spent their life on the sea fishing. They're afraid they're going to drown. Jesus is sleeping in, in the boat on a cushion, which I think is funny. They wake him up and says, don't you care? The boat's coming apart. We're going down. He said to them, why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear. And said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? The disciples were afraid of the storm and the waves, and Jesus wakes up, they wake him up, and he says, Peace, be still, and the sea is like glass. By the way, in Revelation 19, when John's given a vision of the end when the new Jerusalem and the new heavens and new earth come, he says, The sea is like glass, calm, peaceful little precursor there. Jesus, with a word, the sea is calm. So they're terrified of the waves enough to wake up Jesus and say, save us. But afterwards, are they like, oh, that's amazing. Thank you. We're, we're chill now. No. They're even more scared. They were terrified and said to one another, one another, who then is this? This is a key question. If you'd like to highlight or underline, you should underline that one. It's the question, really, of the entire book of Mark, and it's certainly the question of our series. If we're going to follow the king, we need to know who he is. And most of the stories are given to reveal to us who he is. And there's a theme of fear that runs throughout each of these stories. They're more afraid of the one in the boat with them who calmed the sea than the raging waves when he was sleeping. Put it this way. There is a fear that Jesus brings, and there is a fear that Jesus relieves. And we need to understand both. In fact, most of us, in my experience, we want to skip right to the relieving fear. Give me peace. Give me comfort. Be my friend. And Jesus wants to do all that. But first, there's a fear that Jesus brings. You cannot really know or experience the fear that Jesus relieves until you understand the fear that Jesus brings. And we see this over and over again in these stories and throughout the scriptures. Fear really is the natural and appropriate response of a human being in the presence of Almighty God. 
When, when's the last time you were afraid? I mean really afraid. Not like scared if somebody came around the corner and surprised you, but I'm, I mean heart trembling, terrified. What was it? I remember uh, years ago, my wife and I took a trip to Cabo San Lucas, Mexico on, on a retreat with other pastors and wives. I know, rough life. Um, but uh, we had a fantastic time uh, getting to know each other, worshiping, serving, and, and, and while there we went down. You've probably seen pictures of that, uh, that la- the rock formations, the arches, the stones at Land's End there. On one side, on the bay side, or the Gulf side, is uh, called the, the um, Lover's Beach. On the other side, it's called Divorce Beach. I thought it was just a play on words. And I noticed that you could walk underneath the arc, arch rock formation to the other side, Divorce Beach, and there's nobody there. It's on the Pacific side. I wanted to see the Pacific, so I went over there. There's no one there. And the waves are coming in, and the sun is just beautiful. I thought, I'm going to do some body surfing. This would be fantastic. Uh, there was no one on the beach, which should have been my first clue. Nobody there. My wife is, maybe you shouldn't go out there. Oh, it'll be fine. So she's on the beach, and I went out and was, it caught a wave, came right in. It was beautiful. It was fantastic. Waves were getting bigger. I was paddled out again and did it again, and it was fantastic. I look at her like she's rolling her eyes, like very impressive, you know. Anyway, the third time, the waves were getting really big now, and I went out a little too far, and I got caught in one. I didn't catch it right. It slammed me to the sand. I went sand up my nose, in my eyelids, up in my gums, turned me around like I was in a washing machine. I didn't know which way it was up. I swallowed a bunch of sea, ocean seawater, and I pushed off to try to come up, but I couldn't get to the surface, and I started panicking. I finally got up and gasping for air. I better swim in, and I started, I put my head down, took like 25 strokes as hard as I could go. I looked my head up again, and I was no closer to shore. It was caught in a current. I'm like, and I, I started to panic. I mean, I was really afraid. And I thought, I got to catch a, ride a wave in. I'm not going to make it. I'm starting to get tired, you know, and panicking. The more, more you panic, the more tired you feel. Caught a wave, rode it in, and it slammed me into the beach, tumbled me around. And I looked up, and Erin's standing over me, looking at me. Like, she said, are you okay? I said, I think so. She said, can I laugh now? <laughs> <laughs> if I'm afraid of the wind and the waves, and I was that day, what about the God who made them? This is why the, the disciples in the boat are terrified. These waves could kill us. We know that. And this man can calm them with a word. Who is this? This is the question the disciples ask. Who then is this? It's the question that we are going to look at. The next three stories are given to answer that question. Who then is this? The next three stories in Mark chapter 5, we'll walk through them, are answering the question the disciples ask in the boat and that we should be asking. Let's look at Mark Mark 5, verses 1 through 5. They came to the other side of the sea. So remember, they sailed from around Capernaum across the top edge of the Sea of Galilee to the region of the Gerasenes, the pagan side, the Gentile side, to the country of the Gerasenes. And when Jesus had stepped out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. He lived among the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he'd often been bound with shackles and chains, but he wrenched the chains apart, and he broke the shackles in pieces. No one had the strength to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always crying out and cutting himself with stones. Notice, Jesus crosses the sea for this man to the unclean region of the Decapolis, the pagan Greco-Roman side, not a place where faithful Jews go. He's also crossing the sea to teach his disciples something about the people he cares about. There's no place he won't go to reach someone. And the whole story, this this passage, is full of imagery of of uncleanness, things that would make a faithful Jew squirm. There's tombs and graves and bones and evil spirits and cutting yourself and blood. This is not something faithful Jews wanted to be around at all, ever. And Jesus sails across the sea to engage this guy in this condition. The man was uncontrollable. Would have been a terrible sight. Maybe some of you have been downtown Chicago on the west side or the south side and, or other, other urban contexts or cities, and you've seen people that clearly have mental illness and addictions. And even though I, I've been in these contexts in ministry many times, even though I want to engage them and share the gospel with them and love them, if I'm honest, probably if you're honest too, there's a part of me that recoils, or at least is a little bit nervous. You too? It's uncomfortable. They seem unhinged. I wonder if it's safe. Imagine that feeling times a thousand. This, nobody can restrain this guy. If he's on your street, what do the police in the first century do? They didn't have police, but if they did, what do they? Sorry. He breaks the handcuffs. Hope he goes away. We're not touching him. Nobody could deal with him. Screaming, cutting himself. It would, it would terrorize the town. And Jesus crosses the sea for this guy. 
Now, we're going to find out that he has uh, uh, many evil spirits, many demons that are oppressing him. And just in case there's some of you out there going, well, this is superstitious ancient stuff, I mean, that's not real. C.S. Lewis, in his book, The Screwtape Letters, says there's two equal and opposite errors we, sh- we should be careful of when it comes to the demonic world, believing in demons. One is to believe in them too much, like an, like an overfixation on the, on the demonic. The second is to disbelieve in them entirely. Which do you think is the more common mistake we make in our culture today? I think it's to disbelieve entirely, to just dismiss it. And the scriptures are clear. Whatever you think about it, there are forces of evil in the world. There are forces of darkness in the world. And and St. Clement, one of the early church fathers, says part of the demonic function is to distort and destroy the image of God in humanity. To make us less than God intended, less than human. That's certainly the case with this man. Jesus and his disciples are barely on shore, and the man rushes up to them, shrieking and wailing and crying out. And then the demons say, through this man's voice, What do you want with us, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? It's interesting, isn't it, when you read through the Gospels, the demons know who Jesus is. The disciples are confused. The demons know. And the text says that he runs up to Jesus and wails and shrieks and then says in a loud voice. It's tempting to think he's saying in a loud voice these things. He's shrieking and wailing and saying these things. The Greek sentence structure might indicate that he's in his humanity crying out like desperate, like a desperate moan for help. And then the demonic says, what do you want with us, Jesus? It's just a picture of total wretchedness, desperation, brokenness. Let's look at verses 14 through 15. So Jesus heals the man. And by the way, some of you will know the story. He asks the demons their name. They say, we are legion for we are many. And the word legion is meant to invoke in the, in the first century mind, Roman legions, which was 6,000 infantrymen, 200 horsemen, and all the wagon trains that went with to support them. The point is a massive, overwhelming force. That's the imagery here. This guy is oppressed by forces way beyond his control or anyone's control. Overwhelming. Jesus asked their name and then cast them out into a herd of pigs. Remember this story? They go over a cliff and into the sea. I've often wondered, what about the poor pig farmer? That seems like an economic disaster for him, you know, <laughs> lost his herd. There's a lot of speculation and scholarly writings about what this means. We don't have time to get into all of it now, but pigs were unclean animals. These are unclean spirits. So unclean spirit to an unclean animal over the cliff into the sea, which was a symbol of the abyss, the place that someday God has prepared for the devil and his demons. And so there's a lot of symbolism going on here, but we don't have time to dive into that. The point is, Jesus liberates this man from forces that were destroying his life. And the herdsmen fled into the city, in the country, and people came to see what it was that had happened, and they came to Jesus, and they saw a demon-possessed man, the one who had the legion, sitting there, clothed, and in his right mind. And they were what? Afraid. They didn't say, thank you, Jesus, for taking away our greatest fear. We're taking away the terror of our town. We're so thrilled you're here. Come teach us about the kingdom. Come have dinner at our house. Stay for a while. Do more miracles. They say, whoa, that guy was scary, but this is terrifying. Much like the disciples, right? There's a fear that Jesus brings. Those who would really encounter him, understand it, feel it. They don't, they don't want Jesus to stay. They want him to leave. We'll read about that in just a minute. Let's look at verses 17 through 20. And they began to beg Jesus to depart from their region as he was getting into the boat. The man who had been possessed with the demons begged him that he might be with him, and he did not permit him, but said to him, Go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. That's a mission statement for our lives. And he went away and began to proclaim in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him, and everyone marveled. In that region of pagan, Gentile, Greco-Roman, unclean cities, this guy is the first Gentile missionary. First one sent to a region other than where the faithful Jewish people lived to talk about who this man was and what he'd done. They begged Jesus to leave town. Why? The fear that Jesus brings. They were more afraid of the authority of Jesus over the evil spirits than they were of the demon-possessed guy who nobody could control or chain up. That's shocking, isn't it? What Jesus does for this man 
is a picture of what he does for everyone who trusts in him. I want you to think about this for a minute. I think it's easy to read this story and think, well, this is kind of crazy, ancient story. I mean, I, I don't engage with a lot of demon-possessed people, and I don't have any of those, thank you very much. And I don't know what this is all about for me. But what Jesus does for this man is a picture for what, of what the gospel does for everyone who comes to Jesus. Let's walk through it. Number one, he comes to this man, and he comes to you. You don't initiate with God. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ today, and if you love him and believe in him and have received his forgiveness, it's because he came to you first. He came into our world as a man. He comes to you and moves people to repentance and faith, to, to recognize my sinfulness and my need. So he comes to you. He pursues us in our desperate condition. Second, he confronts the darkness in each of us. Whatever label you want to put on it, there's, a, there's darkness in every one of our hearts that Jesus, when he comes to us, wants to confront. And number three, he heals and restores us, forgives our sin, and restores us and gives us a hope. And then he dresses us or clothes us in his righteousness. Remember the phrase, the man was dressed in his right mind? Can you imagine what that was like for those people? Just for a minute, think about it. Your, your whole life, there's been this crazy guy over there in the tombs that, no, that everyone's terrified of and nobody can control. And then you come and you see him and you can hardly recognize him. I remember years ago, I w we worked on uh, missions trips on the south side of Chicago, and there was a guy named Odell who had deep addiction problems, mental illness, and you know, though we wanted our kids to engage with the people of the community and, and share Jesus with them, this was a guy that we were advised, keep your kids away from him. He's just not, he's just not right. One year, I, we went to the drop-in center, the soup kitchen where they have there, and I saw this guy, and I, he looked familiar to me. I, who is that? And Pastor Tony said, oh, that's Odell. He's gotten sober, he's on medication. It's remarkable what's happened in his life. I could barely recognize him. Think about that times a million with this guy, right? He's dressed. No more scratching, shrieking, wailing, breaking chains, crying out. Sitting there in his right mind, Jesus clothes us in his righteousness, we're told. The scripture over and over again says that we're clothed. Ephesians tells us to put off the old self and put on the new self to create to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Revelation 19 says the saints around the throne will be clothed in a white robe. It's an image of Jesus clothing us and he restores us to our right minds, gives us an eternal perspective. And then he sends us out, doesn't he? To go home and tell your friends how good God is all that he's done for you, how merciful he's been to you. The people of that region experienced the fear Jesus brings, and they sent Jesus away. The disciples stay with him, and they experience the fear that Jesus relieves. And that's what the next two stories are about. Let's look at verses 21, 23. And when they crossed again in the boat to the other side, so now they're coming back from the eastern shore where the Decapolis and the pagan region was, back over to Capernaum to the western shore. A great crowd gathered about him, and he was beside the sea. Then came one of the rulers of the synagogue. Now, just pause there for a minute. Remember our stories from the, on Sabbath day healings and the synagogue rulers and the Pharisees. Are rulers of the synagogue generally so far friends of Jesus? No, they're opponents. They want to trap him. They, want, they, they, want to, they despise him. They want to get rid of him. Jairus by name, and seeing him, he fell at his feet and implored him earnestly, saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her, so that she may be made well and live. This ruler of the synagogue is also a desperate father. And desperate fathers don't care about social protocols or religious rules. Here's Jesus, who his friends and his colleagues and his peers want to get rid of, but he's heard the stories that this man is doing things that no one else can do, and my girl is dying. I don't care what my friends think. I don't care what my peers think. I will do whatever it takes. So he comes to Jesus in front of the crowd, falls down at his feet, and begs Jesus, help me, help my little girl. And we find out later she's 12 years old. She's a middle school student. And she's near death. And Jesus goes with the man. I imagine his like, little, little spark of hope. Jesus is coming. Hold on. 
Hold on, little girl. Jesus is coming. And a large crowd follows them. So on the way, something crazy happens, which we're going to talk about in detail. But there's a massive crowd following Jesus. Everywhere Jesus went now, news is spreading about him, so the buzz is building, and he can't really get away from people unless he withdraws to, like, isolated places. In, in, in the towns, he, there's always a crowd around him, and there's a massive crowd around him now. I, I remember when the Cubs won the World Series, which seems like a lifetime ago, but they did. And I went downtown, my wife and someone downtown to, to the parade. You know, people jammed in, shoulder to shoulder, walking the streets and celebrating. Like, you couldn't, you couldn't not touch somebody if you wanted to get close to the Cubs because there were so many people. No social distancing in those days, right? So this is the kind of the image I have in my mind of this. A crushing crowd all around as Jesus is making his way with Jairus. And Jairus is probably like, let's go, hurry up, get these people away. We've got to get to my daughter. Let's look at verses 25 and through 28. And there was a woman who had a discharge of blood for 12 years, who had suffered much under many physicians. She'd spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. That sounds like a very contemporary description, right? Tried everything. Every doctor in network, out of network, spent all of her resources, and, and she doesn't have anything left, and she's worse than she was. Also, a woman, a bleeding woman, was an unclean person, and she should not be in the crowd, according to Jewish law, but she's there. She had heard the reports about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if I touch even his garments, I'll be made well. Now, why does she think that? We, we can't go too far into the detail here, but if you go to the Old Testament, the last book of the Old Testament is the Italian prophet Malachi. Just want to see if you're listening. It's Malachi. Uh, uh, in Malachi chapter 4, verse 2, some of you are like, uh, okay, but you're listening now. In Malachi chapter 4, verse 2, there's this, the prophecy about the Messiah. There will be healing in his wings when he comes. Wings, the Hebrew word for wings is the word kanaf. It also can mean corners. And if you ever see a Jewish, Orthodox Jew with their prayer shawls, and they have their prayer shawls, right? The corners have these tassels attached to them and with, with five knots for the five books of, of, of the Torah. Anyway, those corners are called their kanaf or their wings in Jewish tradition. So the, the, the legend grew the, the pro, about this prophecy that the Messiah, when he comes, will have his prayer shawl. And his prayer shawl, the kanaf, the wings, corners of his prayer shawl, will, put, will possess powers, healing. So if I could just, I don't, I don't want to make a scene. I don't want to get exposed. I don't want to be shamed publicly like I've been many times in my life. I just want healing. And maybe if I could just touch the corner of his wings, his kanaf, his robe, I could be healed. So she does, does that. And she is healed. Her bleeding stops. But nobody knows this but her. And apparently somebody else, which we're going to find out. She's a total social and moral outsider. But she had enough faith to come to Jesus, even though she was in complete faith. Let's look at verses 30 through 34. And Jesus, perceiving in himself that power had gone out from him, immediately turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my garments? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing around you, and yet you say, Who touched me? And he looked around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came, there it is again, in fear and trembling, and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. Then he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. This is an amazing story. I don't know if we quite grasp it. Jesus could have just said, Ah, like in his own mind, thank you, Father. I know that woman was made well, but I've got, you know, to get to Jairus' daughter, that's more important. A bleeding woman, dying child, you know, I can come back to her later even. But she's healed, nobody else has to know, let's keep going. That's what I would have done. Seems logical, seems right, doesn't it? He doesn't do that. He stops, and he says, who touched me? Which is, the disciples are like, that's ridiculous. What do you mean, who touched me? Everybody's touching everybody in the crowd. What do, you, who, what do you mean, who touched me? Jesus goes, no, someone touched me in a way, in a unique way. Power has gone out from me. And there's only two people in the whole crowd who know what he's talking about. Jesus and the woman. Everybody else is like looking around. Jairus must be desperately going, come on, Jesus. But he won't let it go. And the woman realizes he won't let it go. And so she comes sheepishly, shamefully, out from the crowd. I, I kind of envision her like peeking out from behind. Like, do I, it's, do I, can I get away with this? Why does Jesus do that? She had been healed physically of her bleeding, but she wasn't restored fully until she meets Jesus face to face. 
She's still hiding in the crowd. Here's maybe the spiritual point for us. You, you can't just come to Jesus to get a little something from him. If you want to follow Jesus, you've got to come out from the crowd. You can't be anonymous. You can't stay hidden. You've got to come out from the crowd and meet him face to face because he calls her daughter. Go in peace. In front of everyone, you're accepted. You belong. You're one of mine. It's beautiful. It's powerful. You know the, the hymn, Amazing Grace? We all know that hymn. There's that line in there, "'Twas grace that taught my heart to fear." And grace, my fear is what? Relieved. There is a fear that Jesus brings, and there is a fear that Jesus relieves. And grace does both, and we need both. And at this very dramatic moment, something really tragic happens. Verses 35, 36. While he was still speaking, there came from the ruler's house some who said, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, Do not fear, only believe. Can you imagine it? Imagine Jairus. The messengers come and say, It's too late. She died. It's no good bothering the rabbi now. Anguish, grief, anger at God, at Jesus. I know some of you have felt that. Why did you delay? Why did you wait? Timothy Keller in his book about this parable says, uh, this story, excuse me, says that someone today who cured a bleeding woman and let a little girl die would be sued for malpractice. The first thing Jesus says to Jairus is not, I'm sorry or don't grieve, is what? Don't be afraid. Just believe. Frederick Buechner in his book, The Alphabet of Grace, says the opposite of faith is not doubt, it's fear. The most commonly given command in scriptures is some form of do not be afraid. And the truth is God's sense of timing often confounds us. Grace almost never operates on our schedule. Jairus comes to Jesus for a cure for his daughter, not a resurrection, but he's about to get more than he he asked for, which is also just like Jesus. But before we read the end of the story here and and make a few observations and then come to the Lord's table, I just want to speak to those of you who have lost someone, particularly those of you who have lost children or grandchildren. I think Jesus says to you, there is pain, there has been death, there is even a delay, but there is also a resurrection. That's why he says to Jairus, don't be afraid, just believe. In this delay, which Jairus feels has been the end, I I think the gospel tells us there is pain, there is death, there is even a delay that we don't understand but there is also a resurrection. Let's read the last part of the story. And when he entered, he said to them, why are you making a commotion and weeping? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. Of course they did. These were, by the way, a combination of family and professional mourners. Those who would gather outside Jairus' home and weep and wail loudly to communicate to the whole city and town and village of the calamity and tragedy that had befallen this family. They know a dead body when they see one. We're removed from death, most of us sanitized and insulated in our culture, but in the first century pagan, Roman, Greco-Roman ancient world, they knew what a dead body looked like. They weren't confused. They laughed. They said, what are you talking about? And Jesus uh, put them all outside, which I think is funny. Okay, you want to laugh? You stay out here. Brings mother and father and his closest with him. Taking her by the hand, he said to her, Talitha kumi, which means... Little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately the girl got up and began walking. For she was 12 years of age. And they were overcome with amazement. How tender is Jesus? Little girl, arise. And she does. Jesus says to all of you who are experiencing delay, 
and wonder if he's there, if he cares about his goodness. The delay we experience in this life is not final. Jesus is. He has the final word. He's king. He's king over disasters and storms. Uh, he's king over disease. He's king over cancer. He's king over even death itself and all the dark powers of this world. Remember the question the disciples asked while trembling in the boat, who then is this? Let's ask this question as we finish. What do we learn about King Jesus from this story? Well, first, we learn there's no place he won't go to reach someone. There are no lengths, no seas he won't cross. He'll pursue us into the darkest place. And number two, there's no dark power that he cannot drive out. I think for many of us, we begin to think about people as they're beyond help, they're beyond hope. That's not true when it comes to King Jesus. And number three, there's no brokenness that he cannot heal and restore. And number four, there is no desperate condition he cannot deliver us from. Ultimately. I'm going to read to you something out of Timothy Keller's book called The... the um, following the king, King Jesus, about, about this gospel of Mark. He writes, Jesus is facing his own death, the most implacable, inexorable enemy of the human race. Such is his power that he holds this child by the hand and gently lifts her right up through it. Honey, get up. Jesus is saying by his actions, if I have you by the hand, death itself is nothing but sleep. Why would we want to hurry someone this powerful and loving who treats us this tenderly? Why would we be impatient with someone like this? Jesus holds us by the hand and brings us through the greatest darkness into his kingdom. We're going to close, as I said, by coming to the Lord's table. And these simple symbols of bread and cup Jesus' followers down through the centuries have come together through these elements to remember him. That the way that he conquered death and darkness and sin and hell itself is by dying. His kingdom works on a different principle. We call that principle grace. And he gave us bread and cup as symbols of his grace. Let's pray and prepare our hearts. King Jesus, we come before you now, and I know there are many in listening both in person and online, who have heavy hearts, who carry deep wounds of sadness and grief and shame and loss, and still ask the question, why? And there are many also who are in the midst of their own delay, begging you to do something. But all of us, Lord, come to you now acknowledging that you're king, and your grace is more than we deserve or could ask or can imagine. We praise you for the grace that teaches our hearts to fear you and the grace that takes away our fear because of your love shown for us at the cross. Speak to us now the words we need to hear as we come to your table. We pray it in your name. Amen. Take out that top layer. Jesus took bread and broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, this is my body and it's given for you. Eat this in his memory. I like to think of the sound of crinkling as the Holy Spirit in the room. <laughs> Jesus says to us now, this is the new covenant in my blood shed for the forgiveness of your sins. Drink this and know that you are washed clean in his love. Amen. His mercy is indeed more. So, so much more. Brothers and sisters, go now in the grace of King Jesus. May you know the grace that brings our hearts to fear him and tremble before him, and more importantly, the grace that relieves our fear because his mercy is more. Amen, and go in peace.